uh, I want to give an introduction to the force of air resistance, or uh, we might also talk about fluid resistance. I guess that's a more general term, right? Air is a, a certain type of fluid. Anything that can flow or take the shape of its container is a fluid. So the rules we'll go over are actually for fluid resistance, but in the end we're mainly going to apply it to um, cases of objects falling through the air. So you probably already witnessed the video that showed how you can determine the viscosity of a fluid. Uh, you can compare the viscosity of honey to motor oil to water or anything else by dropping marbles through uh, graduated cylinders filled with the fluid and noticing the time it takes for them to fall. The equation that governs the force encountered by a spherical object moving through a fluid is known as Stokes Law. Stokes Law says the resistive force felt by a spherical object as it falls through a fluid is equal to 6 pi times the radius of the spherical object multiplied by the viscosity and multiplied by the speed with which the object is falling. So this is the Greek letter eta, if you're not familiar with that, and it stands, it represents the viscosity of the fluid. The R we see here is the radius. So Keep in mind that Stokes' law applies to spherical objects. Uh, like raindrops falling through the air, that would be another example, right? So whether this spherical object right here represents one of the marbles that's falling through something like oil, or it represents a rain droplet, there are a couple forces acting on it as it falls. Of course, there's gravity, mg. And then there's a resistive force back upwards. We'll just call it F subscript R. So the magnitude of that force is given by Stokes' law. Now, the force then is velocity dependent. The faster it goes, the greater this force becomes. So we'll go over the details of um, the result of having a force that depends on velocity. Gravity doesn't depend on velocity, right? You weigh the same amount whether you're at rest or moving quickly. But force of air resistance very much depends on velocity. So um, Stokes' law also applies to oil droplets falling through the air. Uh, the reason I bring up oil droplets falling through the air, is here's a schematic of a very famous experiment, one that won Robert A. Milliken the Nobel Prize in 1923 in order to determine the charge on an electron, on a single electron. Uh, it was very difficult to do. It's hard to isolate single electrons. Millikan was able to get a small number of electrons on tiny droplets of oil, and by noticing the way that they fall under the influence of a uh, electric field created by a battery, he was ultimately able to measure the charge of a single electron. This is an experiment you're gonna repeat next semester in Physics 4B. Uh, and so once again, Stokes' Law will come up. Hopefully you'll remember this equation when you get to that point next semester. Well, what if the object isn't spherical? What if you have an object that falls at low speed through a fluid or through air, like a falling leaf from a tree? Then instead of writing Stokes' Law, 6 pi r a to v, don't really know how to describe the radius of a leaf, so it doesn't apply. But notice this has the general form, as long as we're only studying one leaf, right? We don't change to a different leaf, then its radius stays the same, the viscosity of air stays the same, 6 and pi are all constants. So this is just in the general form, F equals some constant multiplied by V. Uh, usually when physicists write this, they pick one of two choices, and I don't know why different textbooks present it differently. Sometimes you'll see it written as F equals BV, or sometimes you'll see it as F equals KV. In any case, B or K just represent a constant we can refer to as the drag coefficient. And it factors in all the constants that influence the motion of the object aside from the velocity. If we want to state this as a vector equation, I guess we can put the vector symbol over the vector quantities, and we should have to put in a negative sign in that case because the force always points opposite the direction of the velocity. So for example, a free body diagram for this leaf, when it first falls from the branch of the tree, 
there's a downward force of gravity, mg, and that's it. There is no resistive force. Because resistive force is a function of velocity, then if the initial velocity is equal to zero, initially there is no resistive force. But as the leaf continues to fall farther and farther, the force mg doesn't change, but now that a little bit of velocity is developed, there's a little resistive force in this direction, bv. If the leaf falls even farther, it could get to the point that that upward force of resistance, bv, is just as great in magnitude as the downward pull of gravity. In that case, the net force would be equal to zero. Now, that doesn't mean the leaf would stop moving. It means it would stop accelerating. In fact, whatever velocity it achieved at the point that these two vectors are equal in magnitude, it'll maintain that velocity for the rest of its fall. And we notice this as typical motion of a falling leaf, right? It doesn't accelerate like most objects when you drop them. They drift to the ground with a steady speed. So we refer to that steady speed. If we see that the... Um, vectors are equal in magnitude, then we can refer to this velocity as V subscript T to stand for terminal velocity. So anything that falls through a fluid ultimately reaches a terminal velocity when the resistive force grows to be just as large as the accelerating force. The same applies to skydivers. A skydiver in this orientation projects a greater amount of surface area to the air that they're falling through. So you can imagine some amount of surface area A. When the skydiver goes into a nosedive instead of a spread eagle position, their surface area becomes a little bit smaller. And so that's going to affect the amount of resistive force. Although a skydiver falls at much higher speeds than rain droplets or marbles falling through oil or Millikan's oil droplets or falling leaves. Those are all examples of objects at low speed. And notice, as long as the objects move at low speed, then the resistive force is a function of velocity to what power? I guess it's the same as velocity to the first power, meaning two times the velocity leads to two times the resistive force. Simple enough. The skydivers move at much greater speeds, and the equation changes for objects moving at high speeds. In that case, we say the resistive force is equal to one-half times the drag constant uh, multiplied by the density of the fluid um, multiplied by the area that the object projects through the fluid and then multiplied by the speed squared. The units for this constant well, there are none. This is a dimensionless quantity, and we can prove that. Since it's meant to calculate a force, we know the results should come out in newtons. And hopefully you know that newtons are the same thing as kilograms times meters per second squared. If you can recall the formula F equals ma, it's not hard to remember that a newton is the same thing as a kilogram meter per second squared. After all, mass is measured in kilograms, and acceleration is measured in meters per second squared, and forces in newtons. Sure enough. Okay, so what units would we have um, on the right side of this equation? So this is, the, this is not a P, this is the Greek letter rho, and it represents density. So that would be the mass per unit volume, or the number of kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, and then um, the area, of course, would be square meters. And then velocity, which gets squared, is in meters per second. So what do we have here? Kilogram per cubic meter times square meter times another square meter, because the meters per second get squared, divided by second squared. Now all this is the same as meters to the fourth. And a meter to the fourth divided by a meter cubed is just a meter, so we're left with kilogram meters per second squared. Yeah, exactly. So I think that should convince you that the constant in this formula is a dimensionless quantity. So you see we use a different formula for objects that move at high speeds compared to objects that move at low speeds. Uh, the fact that the force of resistance depends on 
area and velocity, you're already familiar with that if you've ever uh, put your car or your hand out the window of a car, which I'm sure you've done. If you project your hand in this orientation where there's a greater amount of surface area, then you feel a lot more resistive force than when you turn your hand sideways in a more aerodynamic orientation. So yeah, without a doubt, the greater the area projected to the fluid, the greater the resistive force. Turns out if you go at a speed of, let's say, 10 meters per second, and then increase it up to a speed of 20 meters per second, the force doesn't double, the force would actually quadruple because the force is proportional to velocity squared at high speeds. So in other words, two times the speed leads to four times the force. So that's the key difference between the force of air resistance at low speed versus high speed. In either case, the force depends on the amount of speed. It's just at low speeds, it depends on velocity of the first power, and at high speeds, it depends on velocity squared. Now this has a big uh, influence on your uh, car's fuel economy. Let me get this out of the way. So when you drive, let's say, at um, 65 miles per hour, which would be approximately 30 meters per second, and then you increase your speed to, uh, oops, sorry, 80 miles per hour. So this is the posted freeway speed, but if you get in the fast lane, it's not uncommon these days for cars to drive 80 miles per hour, uh, which would be about I guess, more like 36 meters per second. It doesn't seem like that much uh, of a percentage increase in your speed. and It's not, but it becomes a large percentage increase in the force of air resistance that your car has to overcome. And if you think about it, it seems like the law of inertia suggests we should get a free ride when we're on the freeway. In other words, we shouldn't have to spend any fuel at all, right? After all, an object in motion likes to stay in motion. So if you were going 36 meters per second, then why can't you just take your foot off the gas pedal and count on the law of inertia to keep you moving at a steady 36 meters per second? Well, of course, it's because mostly we have to overcome this force of air resistance. There's also something known as rolling friction between your tires and the road, but the vast majority of the fuel costs when driving on the freeway is to overcome this force of air resistance and a slight increase in speed leads to a large increase in force. So um, I recommend you just see what happens. Try it for a couple weeks. Drive at uh, only 65 miles per hour on the freeway and uh, see how much you can improve your car's fuel economy. So at low speed, a spherical object is governed by Stokes' law and it's an equation that tells us velocity influences the force according to this equation. In general, if the object isn't spherical, we can state the equation more generally as F equals BV or F equals KV. And again, at high speed, the force is proportional to velocity squared as opposed to just velocity to the first at low speeds. So in our next video lesson, um, we'll show how we can use equations of this form to derive expressions for speed as a function of time for objects that are uh, moving under the combined influence of gravity and air resistance.